ever get the feeling that like some of our best scientific discoveries were just hiding in plain sight? You know, like right there mm-hmm. all along. Mm-hmm. Today, we're going to dive into a text that suggests just that. We're going to take a look at how an ancient Roman poet, Lucretius, was wrestling with concepts that, like, we now associate with cutting-edge physics. Oh, this is going to be good. We're going to unpack how a poem from the first century B.C. anticipated insights in fluid dynamics and chaos theory. How often did you get to say that? Right. right. So our source material, for anyone tuning in, we're looking at excerpts from Serres, The Birth of Physics, and we're really zeroing in on Lucretius's De Rerum Natura. Okay. I'll be honest. It's... uh a bit dense in places. Sure. But don't worry, we're here to pull out like the most mind blowing nuggets for you. Absolutely, yeah. And I think what often gets overlooked with Lucretius mm-hmm. is that, you know, people kind of pigeonhole him as a philosopher. But um Right. His work was really tuned into observing the natural world and like in a way that honestly prefigures a lot of modern science. So instead of like just sitting around thinking about how the world should work, he was actually like looking around, sure. observing how it does work. Think back to, like, the intellectual heavy hitters, right? Mm. Plato, Descartes, even Newton to an extent. There's this real emphasis on order, on these idealized systems. Okay, yeah. Lucretius, he was captivated by the messiness, the realities of nature, mm. particularly fluids. Fluids. Their unpredictable movements, all of that. That's really interesting. Like, you know, we often think about science as this, like, straight line of progress. But it sounds like Lucretius was onto something that maybe got, like, temporarily misplaced along the way. I think so, yeah. Why do you think that is? Like, why weren't his ideas given more weight at the time? That is a question that Sears really digs into. And his argument is that, you know, because Lucretius was so into this unpredictable nature of fluids, you know, mm-hmm. that really went against the grain of um, the more rationalistic, order-focused thinking that was, you know, kind of like top dog back then. It's fascinating because in a way, modern science kind of had to go through its own rebirth through the study of fluids, too. You know, It's making me think about da Vinci and his, like, obsession with water. Right. Or, like, Torricelli, who invented the barometer. Yeah. Or Benedetti and all his work on, like, the motion of falling bodies and stuff. They were all grappling with these ideas of flow, resistance. And it sounds like Lucretius was already hinting at these things centuries earlier. Totally, yeah. It's like he caught these glimpses of a deeper understanding of physics. You know, that just like wouldn't be fleshed out for centuries. Wow. And at the heart of his ideas is this wild concept called the Kleinemann. Kleinemann. Okay. Tell me more about that because I have no idea what that is. All right. So imagine atoms, right, moving through the void. They're not just traveling in straight lines. They have these tiny, these unpredictable swerves. Okay. So less like a straight shot, more like cosmic pinball. Got it. And this tiny detail, this Kleinemann, it underpins like Lucretius's entire view of how the world works. Imagine like a ray of sunlight hitting those dust motes in a room, you know? Oh, yeah. I love how those little particles just dance in the light. Exactly. And Lucretius would say, that's the Kleinemann at work. It's the constant but unpredictable swerving of atoms that allows for collisions, combinations, and ultimately for everything around us to exist. So not just atoms, like neatly lining up like soldiers in formation. No, no, no. This is much more dynamic. Okay, so... If this Kleinemann is all about randomness, how does that connect to chaos theory? Oh, that's where it gets really interesting. Well, think about, um, you know, the butterfly effect. Okay. This idea that a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil. Right. And it can lead to a tornado in Texas. Right. right? That's chaos theory, right? Small, seemingly insignificant actions can have huge, unpredictable consequences. Wow. And that's what Lucretius was getting at with the Kleinemann. It totally changes how you view cause and effect, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. Instead of that straight line, it's more like this, like, interconnected web of events, you know? Exactly. And that brings us to another really fascinating aspect of Lucretius's work, which is uh, his ideas about how things come into being. Okay. And I don't just mean, like, what they're made of, but the how, you know? So not just describing, like, a mountain, but, like, the forces that shaped it over time. Exactly. The process. Yeah, yeah. The dynamic interplay of forces. Right. And here's where it gets even more wild. Okay. Sarah suggests that the Lucretius's insights into fluid dynamics, they actually have this really surprising connection to the work of Archimedes. Wait, Archimedes? Yeah. Like, Eureka. Archimedes. That's the one. The guy who figured out buoyancy and built all those crazy war machines. 
Yeah, yeah. What does he have to do with atoms and chaos? More than you might think. Yeah. So we all remember Archimedes for, like, his inventions, right? Yeah. But he was also this brilliant mathematician. Right. And he was obsessed with spirals and cones. Okay. And the way fluids interact with solid bodies. Now that you mention it, yeah, those shapes are everywhere in nature. Right. Like seashells, whirlpools, even the way <laughs> vines climb, it's kind of crazy. Exactly. And Sarah's doesn't think those echoes are accidental at all. Okay. He says that Archimedes' mathematical work, with all its focus on curves and flows, it resonates deeply with Lucretius's whole atomist vision. Wow. So we've got this, like, hidden dialogue going on Man. between a Roman poet and a Greek mathematician. And they're both like grappling with these ideas that seem incredibly modern. It really makes you rethink, you know, the whole like traditional narrative of how science progresses. Right. Really does. Yeah. Like, these guys were brilliant. Yeah. And it gets even more interesting when you realize that Lucretius connected his ideas about physics to questions about ethics, ethics, like how to live a good life. Hold on. Are you saying there's a connection between how atoms move and how we should live our lives? For Lucretius, there absolutely was. Wow. Okay. So just like atoms are always striving for a kind of equilibrium. Okay. Even in the middle of all this chaos. Right. He believed that people, we should strive for a state of inner peace. Inner peace. Tranquility. We call ataraxia. Ataraxia. Which sounds no, nice, right? It does. Yeah. It's about achieving that inner peace amidst all the storms of life. Yeah. You know? Yeah, like a state of Zen calmness. That's a great way to put it. Okay. Lucretius believed that by cultivating this ataraxia, this calmness, mm -hmm. by not letting ourselves get swept away by, you know, all the stuff that happens. Right. We could find this sense of stability and freedom even in a world that's defined by constant change. And that's definitely something we can all relate to these days, right? Absolutely. Like in this age of information overload, constant connectivity, right, right. what are our strategies for finding that inner ataraxia? I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. It really is. You know, it's interesting because this whole idea of finding balance within chaos, right? Yeah. Of things constantly forming and reforming. Yeah. Lucretius applied that not just to individual lives, but to history itself. To history. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. So you're saying history is like one giant chaotic dance of atoms. In a way, yeah. Yeah. Lucretius and Sarah's really picks up on this. They argue against this idea of history as like a linear progression, okay. a straight line from A to B. So not just like a neat timeline of dates and battles. Exactly. Instead, it's this swirling vortex of events, yeah. this constant interplay of forces where tiny seemingly insignificant moments they can have these massive unforeseen consequences so like the kleinemann but on this huge historical scale exactly huh it makes me rethink all those historical narratives we're taught in school you know yeah the simplified stories of progress and decline right maybe history is less about the grand narrative and more about this like messy dance of all these individual stories all colliding and intersecting and now you're getting it mm -hmm. and it's through that lens you know that lucretian lens of fluidity of interconnectedness yeah that we can really appreciate the complexity and dynamism of the past wow yeah it's interesting right how lucretius's ideas can make us like question even the way we think about history yeah yeah totally like, we take it for granted yeah for sure but he's got this whole different way of looking at it. It reminds me of, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, the, those historians we might disagree with. Right. I think it's like it reminds us that everybody's coming to this with their own perspectives and biases. You know what I mean? Totally. It's like we're all just catching these like glimpses of these swirling vortices of history. And yeah. we're trying to like piece together some coherent narrative. Exactly. From these little fragments that we can see. And I think that's the thing, right, is if we can kind of acknowledge that inherent complexity. Yeah. And embrace this idea that it's not a straight line, but this, like, turbulent flow. Right. Maybe we can approach it with a little more humility, you know. Totally. Instead of, like, looking for those easy answers well, makes... or trying to fit everything into these neat little categories. Yeah, yeah. We just have to kind of embrace the messiness totally. and the contradictions and like the unexpected connections and that's where it gets really interesting i think totally yeah it makes it much more fun too it does and yeah. it's much more i think it's a more honest way to engage with it totally so you were talking about how lucretius saw this connection between his ideas about like atoms and physics and the how of things coming into being right Right. Can you unpack that a bit more for me? Yeah, totally. And I, I think it's a really crucial distinction that Sarah points out, which is that Lucretius, 
he wasn't content to just, you know, be like, here's the world. Here's what it is. Right, right. He wanted to understand, like, the processes, the underlying, like, forces okay. that actually shape and reshape reality itself. You know what I mean? So it's not just about what things are. It's, like, the process of how they got that way and how they're continuing to change. Exactly. It's understanding the world as this dynamic process, right? Yeah. Rather than just these static entities. Right. And so, you know, for Lucretius, even seemingly... Really solid, permanent things like mountains, you know, yeah. yeah, or the earth itself, those are ultimately composed of atoms in constant motion. Wow. It's just happening on a time scale that we perceive as slow, you know? It's like those time lapse videos where you see like a flower bloom in like 10 seconds, but it took like hours or days to actually like, do it. Exactly. Yeah. And Lucretius would say that's happening all the time, right? Wow. At all levels. It's just the rate of that change can be dramatically mm -hmm. different. And I think that allows us to hold both of those things, right? The dynamism mm -hmm. and the apparent stability of the yeah. world around us at the same time. That's wild. I mean, like, our bodies are doing that too, right? Like, right. we're constantly changing on a cellular level. We are walking, talking embodiments of Lucretius's theories. Right. It's crazy. It's like we are all just, like, these atoms swerving through the void, ah. trying to, like, make our way. And it all comes back to that idea of ataraxia, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, finding that sense of inner peace, even amidst, like, all of it, okay. all the chaos. Yeah, yeah, totally. So how do we do that, right? Like, what do we do? Yeah, is it about trying to control the chaos or just, like, learning to, like, dance with it mm -hmm. or something? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? And, you know, I don't think Lucretius would say, like, just, like, passively accept whatever comes your way, you know? Yeah. It's more about, like, how can we engage mindfully with the world? Yeah, right? like, okay. Recognize those Kleinemann moments, those opportunities yeah. for change, for growth. Right. And uh, approach the challenges with that same sense of, like, you know, balance and resilience. Mm -hmm. Huh. It's a powerful idea that even though there's so much, like, uncertainty and change swirling around, like, wow. we can still find our own sense of, like stability right, yeah. and purpose by kind of like embracing that fluidity. Totally. Yeah. It's not about pretending it's not there. Right. It's about like, okay, how do we work with this? Yeah, exactly. Work with it, not against it. Exactly. So cool. Uh, what do you think? Are we ready to like wrap up this deep dive? I think so. We covered some serious ground today. We did. I feel like my brain is like Full of atoms. Full of swerving at it. Swerving all over the place. I love it. Well, thank you so much for taking us on this, like, whirlwind tour. Of the Lucretian universe. It was my pleasure. I learned so much. This was awesome. And listeners, thank you for tuning in to this deep dive. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Keep those minds open, stay curious, and never underestimate the power of a good swerve.